it's going to be an exciting time. More will be invented in the next five to 10 years than the history of mankind. And leading the charge in that acceleration will be being able to manufacture at nanoscale. Welcome to Stories from the NNI. This series features voices from the U.S. National Nanotechnology Initiative. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. For this episode, I had the opportunity to speak with Jim Phelps, CEO of Nanomac, a nanomanufacturing company based in Arkansas that specializes in lubricants, coatings, and cutting tools. Jim, can you tell me a little bit about Nanomac? Sure. Nanomac is a 15-year-old company. All of the first 10 years were really dedicated to research and development and developing a huge patent portfolio. About six years ago, we started really working on building out the factories, quality control, repeatability, scalability to Six Sigma standards and started bringing on our early alpha beta customers. But we have moved into a variety of industries where leveraging nanotechnology, nanoengineering, and nanomanufacturing, we've been able to produce whole new generations of products for oil and gas industry, aerospace, automotive, defense, manufacturing, and I know I'm missing something here, even even racing, you know, when it comes to the Indy 500 and so forth, where you have to really prove yourself as being significantly better. One thing we learned early on at Nanomech is you don't win by having a 5% improvement or a 10% improvement. So our improvements typically, you know, are in the variety of vicinity of 60% to 300%, upwards to over 1,000% better than existing products that are out there today. When I look at what's happening in the world of material science, which is really what we are as a material science company that uses nanoengineering and and manufacturing, it's gonna be an exciting time. More will be invented in the next five to 10 years than the history of mankind. And leading the charge in that acceleration will be being able to manufacture at nanoscale, because that's gonna usher in a whole new generation of, of products that are better because you can build them in a more complex way that ends up with a higher quality product, a better functioning product, more performance, more efficiency, and even drives sustainability. You mentioned material science, and and I have to say that as a material scientist, I agree with you, and I I get very excited about the the innovations that that are emerging. And you mentioned not only a number of sectors where they're applied, but but some of the attributes that you can achieve with nanotechnology. Can Can you tell us a little bit about what excites you about this technology? I I come out of the IT world, my first 20, 30 years of business. And, you know, I saw early on and got to be a part of this analog to digital conversion, re-architecting of everything to digital. And that was exciting. And I could see just how fast it could happen. Of course, during that time, every time we'd say, you know, we're going to disrupt the market and you need to be prepared to innovate or die as we move everything into a digital world. People would say, well, you know, what I've got is good enough. And so they didn't really grasp, you know, just how transitional, how transformative these technologies are. And to anyone out there that's listening, you need to always be prepared for that. What we do at Nanomet, we're primarily in things like lubricants and coatings, paints, and things like that that may sound boring on the surface, but at the end of the day, one must remember that the world runs on machines and machines run on lubricants and coatings and so forth. And so as you move towards Iron Man suits and new types of aviation and cars and so forth, uh, undergirding all of that is nanoscience in a variety of, of different ways. And this is on the material science side. You know, equally you know, astounding will be the move in the bioscience areas as to how you're able to manipulate matter down at the nanoscale. And that's what we do. No different than we moved from an analog world down to binary and changed everything overnight. Uh, the same thing's going to be happening with nanotechnology. I think that uh, when I, especially when I talk with students, looking at what they can imagine and having an entirely new toolbox available to them, I think is going to going to take us places that we can't imagine yet. Could you talk a little bit about where you see the future of your company, where you expect to be in five years? Well, we're growing at an incredible rate right now, and it's because we focused in on four or five of those industries I mentioned. One of the things we're doing right now for the U.S. Army 
is developing the next generation U.S. Army combat uniform. And one of the great things about nanotechnology for anyone that's using it for a variety of purposes is the fact that you know, with nano science, you can bring in multifunctionality. We've moved into areas, not to get too technical, but that are both macromolecular, macrostructured, macrocomposite, and even intercalated to create open architectures so that we can create things like nanotribological films that just don't leave the surface and take the coefficient of friction down to right at zero and then adheres so well that it stops in anywhere. In cutting tools that cut all the machines, you know, we cut um, most of the engines today, jet engines, things like that that are really hard surfaces like new composites and things that are titanium al you know, alloys. They, they are really tough to, to cut, but once you've got precision cutting with new types of cutting tools and coatings on those cutting tools that are nanostructured, we have the ability to cut like never before, create new designs, make better machines, create tighter tolerances, more extreme pressure, so the machines can, at the operating scale, can go faster, can turn, and do all kinds of performance level increases because they were cut differently. And suddenly, you've moved forward a thousand percent, two thousand percent in terms of operational capability using a variety of nanoscience, nanotechnology. And one of the things that we've really, really really focused on is is the intellectual property. So, you know, before we got out there and put all this brain power to work and began developing all of this is we we created a major IP program so that we patented thousands and thousands of patents and claims to go with this, which I would recommend to anybody in nanotechnology at this point because there's a lot of countries, a lot of people out there today that are after this industry in a big way they should be, but you know, we're in a moon race, so it's very important to nail down your intellectual property early, go international with it, it's very expensive. So that may be one of the problems too with nanotechnology in terms of its emergence is it's really expensive play in material science because not only do you have to pay for the intellectual property, develop it, but then you have to develop the factories. And you know, they better have a high degree of quality control, repeatability, scalability, which we do. A lot to do to play in this space, but there's still so much, much room and so many, many, many new improvements to current products and new inventions that are on the way due to nanoscience. How have you been engaged with the National Nanotechnology Initiative? Well, we've had a lot of meetings with NNI and we've you know, been a part of the Nano Business Commercialization Alliance and they interface there as well. And it's just been great and it connects into NSF and so forth. So, it does provide a tremendous uh, visibility for us as to where it's going and how it's developing. We think that the United States needs to realize it's in truly a moon race here in this science and technology, given it undergirds all the new. You know, what gets the attention might be an autonomous car or, you know, a new type of aircraft or what have you. But, you know, I can guarantee you that what's making that perform that way are the new coatings, the new lubricants, the new uh, capabilities that we, we provide and others provide that allow it to operate under the most hostile conditions, under the most extreme conditions, and then be able to take from a surface standpoint all types of hostile conditions there, avoid corrosion. I mean, we have virtually at Nanomac eradicated corrosion through nanotechnology. The other thing is you're able to do these things very safely. I mean, using nanoscience, and we've won a couple of EPA awards we're very proud of uh, in terms of how we basically create our nano-engineered products. And the way we're able to do that is by taking out, for instance, the harsh chemicals. We don't need them anymore. If we're able to nanoscale, we can take out things like ZDDP and replace it with things like canola oil that has absolutely no harm to our oceans, to our people, to our planet. And so, times a hundred other things. I mean, we're able to create new generations of fireproof textiles for whether it's the firemen or the army or, you know, even pajamas for babies. And you take out things that just historically have been used like bromine and replace it with a new type of substance that is nano-engineered that is totally, absolutely not harmful to skin or anything else. It's got the capability to both increase performance, increase efficiency, and increase sustainability like no other material 
ever has before when it's nano-engineered. That's fantastic. You mentioned NSF and DOD and EPA, and of course, there are three of the 20 agencies that make up the NNI. I think that those are great examples. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stories from the NNI. If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit www.nano.gov and check back here for more stories.